Seize the Time, the story of the Black Panther Party and Huey P. Newton by Bobby Seale. 1968 Forward, there are a lot of misconceptions about the Black Panther Party. I wanted to write this book so people could have better insight into the inner workings of the party so that people would have a more true understanding of the Black Panther Party, what it really does, the kind of people who are in it, their everyday lives, the things that have happened to the party. Many things about us that appear in the mass media are distortions. In addition, the demagogic politicians have lied about the party and have lied about who the real enemy is. But here are the facts. A picture of what the Black Panther Party really is and how it operates. This book shows the chronological development of our party and how it grew out of the social evils of an unjust, oppressive system. It also shows that repression is a natural product of this wealthy technological society owned and controlled by a small minority of the people. Marx and Lenin would probably turn over in their graves if they could see lumpen proletarian Afro-Americans putting together the ideology of the Black Panther Party. Both Marx and Lenin used to say that the lumpen proletariat wouldn't do anything for the revolution. But today, in a modern, highly technological society, with its CIA, FBI, electronic surveillance, and cops armed and equipped for overkill, here are black Americans demanding our constitutional rights and demanding that our basic desires and needs be fulfilled thus becoming the vanguard of a revolution despite all attempts to totally wipe us out we're not the vanguard because we wanted to be but because it was given to us through the blood and death of our members and because nearly 100 of us are political prisoners at present so I see this book as the work of our leader and Minister of Defense, Huey P. Newton, and of our apprentice, Bunchy Carter, Bobby Hutton, John Huggins, Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, and all of our brothers who have been murdered, and of political prisoners like Erica Huggins, Langdon Williams, Rory Heathy, the Panther 21 in New York, and the Panther 14 in Connecticut of political exiles like Eldridge and Kathleen Cleaver and all the dedicated Black Panther Party members functioning throughout the country. The life and existence of the Black Panther Party, the ideology of the party in motion, is a biography of oppressed America, black and white, that no news report, TV documentary, book, or magazine has yet expressed. To do so, the media would let the people know what's really going on how things have happened and how we're struggling for our freedom. So before the power structure through its pigs attempts to murder any more of us or take more political prisoners in this age-old attempt to keep us niggers as they like to say in our place I have put together the true story of the Black Panther Party. I dedicate this book to my wife Artie, to Erica, the widow of John Huggins to my son, Malik Nkrumah Stagger Lee Seal, and his brother. One of my son's names derives from the lump and proletarian politically unaware brothers in the streets. Stagger Lee fought his brothers and sisters, and he shouldn't have. The Stagger Lees of today should take on the messages of Malcolm X, as Huey Newton did, to oppose this racist, capitalist oppression our people and other peoples are subjected to. Malik must not fight his brothers. One is named after revolutionaries of our times. And me, who loves both of them, power to the youth, all power to the people, and power to the latest born in the Black Panther Party. Little Huey Bunchy, little Bobby John Eric Eldred Seal, whose mother is Rosemary. Brothers and sisters, will struggle together in unity from generation to generation for liberation and freedom with the love of we fathers and mothers who brought our young ones into the world. We dedicate this book to all the youth of America from Huey, the Central Committee, 
and all the dedicated members of the Black Panther Party. Bobby Seal, Chairman, Black Panther Party, led by the Minister of Defense, Huey P. Newton. San Francisco County Jail, 1969-1970. Huey P. Newton, Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party, the baddest motherfucker ever to set foot in history. Huey P. Newton, the brother, black man, and nigger, the descendant of slaves who stood up in the heart of the ghetto at night in alleys, confronted by racist pigs with guns and said, My name is Huey P. Newton. I'm the Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party. I'm standing on my constitutional rights. I'm not going to allow you to brutalize me. I'm going to stop you from brutalizing my people. You got your gun, pig. I got mine. If you shoot at me, I'm shooting back. Growing up before the party. Who I am. When Malcolm X was killed in 1965, I ran down the street. I went to my mother's house and I got six loose red bricks from the garden. I got to the corner and broke the motherfuckers in half. I wanted to have the most shots that I could have this very same day Malcolm was killed. Every time I saw a paddy roll by in a car, I picked up one of the half bricks and threw it at the motherfuckers. I threw about half the bricks and then I cried like a baby. I was righteously crying. I was pissed off and mad. Every paddy I see, whop, I threw a brick and it would hit the cars and zoom. They're driving down the street and I'm throwing bricks for a motherfucker. I thought that's all I could do. I was ready to die that day. Kenny Freeman and the rest of the cultural nationalists came down there to get me and I told them to leave me alone. I said, get away, you niggas are crazy. I got mad and I busted a window in the house. I put my fist through a window. I told them all, fuck it, I'll make my own self into a motherfucking Malcolm X. If they want to kill me, they have to kill me. That was a big change with me. They never understood that. Eldridge says Malcolm X had an impact on everybody like that. And Malcolm X had that impact on me. When my wife Artie and I had a baby boy, I said, The nigga's name is Malik Nkrumah Stagger Lee Seal. I don't want him named that, Artie said. I had read all that book history about Stagger Lee, that black folkloric history, because I was hung up on that stuff at that time. So I said, Malik Nkrumah Stagger Lee Seal. Why Stagger Lee? Artie asked. Because Stagger Lee was a bad nigga off the block and didn't take shit from nobody. All you had to do was organize him, like Malcolm X, make him politically conscious. All we have to do is organize a state, like Nkrumah attempted to do. Nkrumah was a bad motherfucker, and Malcolm X was a bad nigga. Huey P. Newton showed me the nigga on the block was ten motherfuckers when politically educated, and if you got him organized, I said, Stagger Lee, put Stagger Lee on his name. Because Stagger Lee was an unorganized nigga. To me, like a brother on the block. I related to Huey P. Newton because Huey was fighting niggas on the block. Huey was a nigga that came along and he incorporated Malcolm X. He incorporated Stagger Lee. He incorporated Nkrumah. All of them. The nigga out of prison knows, Huey used to say. The nigga out of prison has seen the man naked and cold. And the nigga out of prison, if he's got himself together, will come out just like Malcolm X came out of prison. You never have to worry about him. He'll go with you. That's what Huey related to. And I said, Malik for Malcolm. And Kruma Stagger Lee Seal. Footnote. Malcolm's Muslim name was El Haj Malik Shabazz. End of footnote. I was born in Dallas, Texas, October 22nd, 1936. I grew up with a brother, a sister, and a cousin who lived with us named Alvin Turner. He was the son of my mother's identical twin. 
off and on, I learned things like everybody else learned things. I'm no different from other people growing up and living and learning. I was raised up like the average black man, like a brother in the black community. A lot of things affected me in a way that caused me to see things. Huey was most significant, but a lot of things in the past affected me before Huey molded my attitude. Unjust things that happened. The farthest back I can remember is when I was unjustly whopped by my father. I can never forget that. My father and mother were having an argument. I was supposed to be washing some shirt in the backyard of a house we had in San Antonio. I was the oldest of three children and was about six years old. I remember very vividly that I was playing in the back and how my father told me to get the wash basin, put some water in it and wash his shirt. I tried to wash his shirt but then I guess I started playing. He was arguing with my mother and it had something to do with that shirt. My father came outside and was mad at me because I hadn't finished the shirt. He took his belt off and really beat me. He went back inside the house and argued again with my mother. I was crying. When he came back and beat me again, my mother came out and stopped him and snatched the strap away. But he got it back from her and argued with her. Then he pushed her and beat me again. He told me to wash that shirt. I never forgot that beating. I never have because it was an unjust beating. The argument he was having with my mother was directly related to him taking it out on me and it wasn't right. My father was a carpenter in Port Arthur, Texas. My mother had left him a couple of times and one time when they got back together he built a house up from the ground. My father was a master carpenter. That's where I learned my carpentry work. I learned drafting in school, but I knew basic building structure from being around my father. He taught it to me and my brother off and on while we were growing up. I grew up just like any other brother. We didn't always have money. During the war we had a little money, but after my father built the house, he went to San Antonio and then we were back in poverty again. It was still war time and there was some money around, but I remember that whenever my mother and father rented a house, they would rent half out to some other people, a whole family. I think the first time I really began to oppose things that I saw was when we were at Cordonis' village, the government housing project in Berkeley. People were living in poverty and semi-poverty. We lived in very crowded conditions with my mother's twin sister and her son. The place was always dirty. My mother always tried to save money, but the money was used up every time my father was laid off. He wasn't able to get in the union at that time. Later, he and three other guys were the only black cats in the carpenters union in all of California. We lived in poverty mostly because of my father's eighth grade education. His father used to be rough on him. My father was a lot rougher on me in certain periods of my life, just like his father was rough on him. His father used to beat him, and one day my father left and wouldn't work for his father anymore. I pulled the same thing. One day I stopped and I wouldn't work for my father anymore because he wouldn't pay me. At that time I didn't know what the word exploitation meant. But that's exactly what it was, and I rejected it and opposed it. My mother never really had any money. When I was 13, I used to make money on my own, hauling groceries and cutting lawns. It wasn't always profitable, but sometimes I could make a dollar or two here and there. Me and a couple of other brothers I used to run around with. I ran around with a couple of gangs in my younger days when I was 14, 15, and 16. Another cousin, who was already grown during World War II, came to stay with us in Port Arthur, Texas, and that's when I first really learned about sex. Through a knot hole, I saw my cousin making love with his wife. My sister and brother and me were all together in this little closet. There was no inner wall section to the inside of the closet and we just happened to be there playing one day while he was making love with his wife. He was in the army and he was getting ready to go to war. We saw them through the hole. That was my first understanding of sex. We called sex peeping because we were peeping through a hole. My mother didn't know what was going on but she said what are y'all peeping at in there? 
that's where we got the term from. During the war, when my cousin got home on leave, we knew he and his wife were going to be peeping. By the time I turned 16, I was more opposed to society and the injustices and bad things in it, but I wasn't very articulate about it. In learning history, I picked up on things that had been done wrong, and I began to find out about the American Indian, how rotten he'd been treated. When I met Steve Brumfield, he was about a month younger than I am, and he's dead now. He killed himself, they say. We were opposed to the white man for taking the land away from the Indians, and we identified with the Indians because our parents had Indian in them. We didn't know about Africa yet. It was very easy for me to identify with Africa when I got to Merritt College. I had gotten rid of the stereotyped notion of American Indians when I was 16 years old. So when the Afro-American Association started talking about identifying, it was easy for me to grasp it and get rid of the Tarzan notion of Africa. Before I went to college, when I was in the service, I wasn't aware of civil rights. I'd been hearing about civil rights through the papers but not focusing in on it that much. I was personally more concerned than with getting some kind of education. I'd go to the library and read a lot, but at the same time, I was trying to get some clothes and I bought a set of encyclopedias. I had also begun to play drums. I'd gotten myself a $600 set of drums, which I was also making payments on. I made a mistake in overloading myself and I got behind three payments on the drums. I bought the drums in Oakland and they sent a collection agency out after I had missed two payments. At the time, in 1958, I was at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota and they went all the way up there to collect. Colonel King, the commanding officer of the squadron, happened to be related to the people who owned the collection agency and he was threatening to put me in jail if I didn't pay my bills. I had run around the base for four months trying to get one of the staff sergeants to co-sign for me to get an allotment that would be automatically taken out of my pay so I could pay off the bill. I wanted to keep my drums because I was engrossed in being a righteous jazz drummer. It was an outlet because you couldn't go anywhere except for the few times we got to go to one of the faraway cities to find a woman or a girlfriend. In the afternoon, I would go with these other cats who were musicians and we had a righteous group. We practiced and rehearsed, went to a movie or a service club, got a hamburger, came back and went to bed. One day Colonel King called me in his office and told me for about the fifth time that he was going to put me in jail if I didn't pay my bill. By that time I was run down and I wanted my drums so I told him Colonel King I'm trying to get the stuff paid off now I'm doing everything I know how. He told me to get my ass out of the office and pay the damn bills off. That night I went downtown and played a gig and I got my fifteen dollars. Another cat came around with a pint of whiskey and I was so pissed off and depressed about the whole situation that I got kinda high. I was supposed to be back at the base by 12 o'clock but when I got there it was 12.30 and the sergeant was waiting. He said he was going to have to report me and then he left. That pissed me off and depressed me more. One of the cats came in and got me to repair something. I was a sheet metal mechanic. And then he came back again with another piece, which I couldn't repair because I didn't have the right kind of extrusions. I tried to fuck around and modify it. He was in such a hurry, he came back in cussing at me. I said, motherfucker, don't be cursing at me. Get your motherfucking ass out of here. I was mad and pissed off. I didn't want anybody messing with me, so he left. Then I got a call on the bitch box, and the guy said, hey, seal. What do you mean you're not going to repair this part for this guy over here? The cat had gone all the way over to the dispatch office a block away. I said, I told that motherfucker I couldn't repair the thing because I couldn't find the right kind of extrusion. I'm trying to modify the damn thing and he's just going to have to wait and stop rushing me and not be coming over here cursing me. Who in the hell do you think you're cursing? The dispatcher said, you'll get court martial for this boy, you know that. I said, fuck you sons of bitches, and I just ripped the bitch box out of the wall. Then the phone rang, 
and I grabbed the phone and just ripped the phone out of the wall. I walked outside into the little office and I saw my toolbox, which reminded me that these motherfuckers were trying to charge me for some tools that some punk had stolen out of my box. And I threw the toolbox across the room. Then I took the table and turned it over. And I went back into the office and turned over one of the desks. My partner Rabbit came in, saw what was happening and knocked me out. He actually knocked me out. He was a partner and he was really trying to help me. He saw I was pissed off and he knocked me out. Got me into a truck and took me into the barracks. When I came to, I walked all around the barracks drinking wine and I wound up in another barracks passed out. The next morning, Rabbit came in, woke me up and told me Colonel King wanted to see me. I had already made up my mind that I was going to jail, so when I went in the office, I didn't even salute the bastard, and I thought to myself, he thinks he's a white guy or something. You ain't paid these bills yet, huh? He said, and I just looked at him. Well, you better pay them goddamn bills. He picked up this little steel model plane from his desk and was waving that thing in my face and talking about putting me in jail. When he said he put my ass in jail, I blew up and grabbed that model plane. The sergeant walked up behind me, jacked me up, got his arm around my neck, pulled me back, and threw me off balance. Another one came up and got my right arm, and they dragged me outside and pushed me up against the wall. I said, let me alone. Tell Colonel King to let me alone. If you're going to take the drums, take the drums. You don't have to put me in jail. He's trying to get the money for them just because he's working with the monkeys downtown. At that point, they just stepped back and let me go. The sergeant said, You better go on in there and tell him that, but you better be cool. I went back and sat down in the chair, and I was just looking at him. I was a distance away from him. He was looking up at me and was writing something up on me. I could see that. This bastard, I said to myself. Now why in the hell should I sit here and let him mess over me? The sergeant and the other cat had seen me sitting down and had gone in the back. So I just got up and walked right on out of the office. I went over to the barracks and I said to myself, I might as well leave this motherfucker. There's no reason for staying here. I ain't never been AWOL, but they can call it whatever they want to call it. I've been in this damn thing here three years and four months, and I'm getting fucked over again later for them. So I proceeded to put on my civilian clothes. The next thing I know, they had 28 policemen over there grabbing me and handcuffing me. I cussed Colonel King out for what he was. I cussed him all the way down the streets. I had a whole big crowd of cats jiving and watching me cuss him out while they were taking me down in front of the barracks and all the way back across the lawn in front of the squadron headquarters. They put me in the truck and I was still cursing them. I cussed them all the way across. Then I blotted them all out. I just forgot about them and they put me in jail. I wouldn't talk to any of them. I wouldn't say anything to anybody. So they said they were going to send me to a psychiatrist. They thought I was crazy. They fooled around for two and a half months and court-martialed me. King told me he was giving me my discharge. A bad conduct discharge. And he said to me, You're not going to be able to get a job when you get out of here, Seal. What the hell makes you think there were any jobs out there before I came here? I said, and I laughed at him. Well, he said, you got five minutes to get off this base. What are you going to do with the other four minutes and 59 seconds? I said, because it won't take me any time to get away from here. Because the colonel pulled that work thing on me, I decided not to let it impress me. I worked in every major aircraft plant and aircraft corporation, even those with government contracts. I was a top flight sheet metal mechanic. They would fire me after two months when they found out about the bad conduct charge. Places would hire me right away because they needed me, but two months or so later they find out. I worked at Kaiser Aerospace Electronics near Oakland for six months. They ran my papers through and came back and said, that I lied on my discharge. If I told you the truth, I wouldn't have had a job. Anyway, I'm doing your work. If you want to fire me, fire me. 
If you don't want to fire me, forget it, and I'll do the work. They needed somebody on the night shift out there, and I knew the whole operation. So the engineer decided to squash it, and he left me alone. This was on the Gemini missile project. I was doing non-destructive testing. It involves testing for microscopic cracks and metals by a complicated chemical and magnetic process. It's a neat trade to learn, and I learned it clean. I quit that job 15 months later because the war was going on and I felt I was aiding the government's operation. I wanted to go to Africa by that time. I was out with the government then and I had become very hip. When I was working at night, I was going to Mary College in the day. When I was working in the day, I was going to Mary College at night. When jobs got scarce in 1959 and 1960 because of the steel strike, I did some drafting work. I could read a blueprint sideways, any kind of precision blueprint. I wanted to be an engineer when I went to college, but I got shifted right away since I became interested in American black history in trying to solve some of the problems. During the court martial, they asked me what I thought about the civil rights movement. I hadn't known the significance of their question, but I was stupid and I had read something about the communists and I said, well, the communists are leading it, ain't they? It's funny the way people learn things and things affect the person. All of 1959 and half of 1960, I was in Los Angeles. In 1960, I worked as a comedian off and on when I first went to Mary College. I dropped out for one semester, but I went back in January of 1961 and I met Huey in September of 1962. That year, I worked as a comedian in two or three clubs around Oakland and at private parties. I think comedians know a hell of a lot. They know a lot of things that are oppressive and wrong. I think that when I met Huey P. Newton, the experience of things I'd seen in the black community, killings that I'd witnessed, black people killing each other, and my own experience, just living, trying to make it, trying to do things, came to the surface. It came to the surface when I met Huey Newton at Mary College. The last eight years, I've been in the struggle in one form or another. I meet Huey. Brother Huey P. Newton put the Black Panther Party into motion. Brother Huey is the Minister of Defense and leader of the Black Panther Party. He is presently a political prisoner, but he is still the philosophical theoretician, the practitioner, the head director, and top official spokesman for the Black Panther Party. It is impossible to talk about the Black Panther Party without first talking about Huey P. Newton because Brother Huey put it all into motion. We sometimes talk about the genius of Huey P. Newton. I met Huey P. Newton in the early 60s during the Cuban blockade when there were numerous street rallies going on around Merritt Junior College in West Oakland. One particular day, there was a lot of discussion about black people in the blockade against Cuba. People were out in front of the college and the streets, grouped up in bunches of 200, 250, what have you. Huey was holding down a crowd of about 250 people, and I was one of the participants. After he held the conversation down to what in those days they called shooting everybody down, that means wrapping off information and throwing facts, people would ask Huey a question or refer to something he said. He tried to shoot Huey down by citing some passage in a book concerning the subject matter being discussed, and before they knew it, Huey whipped out a copy of Black Bourgeoisie by E. Franklin Frazier and showed him what page, what paragraph, and corrected the person. I guess I had the idea that I was supposed to ask questions in college, so I walked over to Huey and asked the brother, weren't all these civil rights laws the NAACP was trying to get for us doing us some good? And he shot me down too just like he shot a whole lot of other people down. He said, it's all a waste of money. Black people don't have anything in this country that is for them. He went on to say that the laws already on the books weren't even serving them in the first place. And what's the use of making more laws when what was needed was to enforce the present laws? So all the money that the people were giving to Martin Luther King and the rest who were supposed to put these laws on the books for black people was a waste of the black people's money. I was ready to accept that when he started citing many more facts to back up his point of view. 
Huey always brings out basic practical things. That's the way he talks to you. That's the way he explains things to you. He gets to a point where you can't get around, so you have to face things. That's the kind of atmosphere I met Huey in. And all the conflicts of this meeting, all this blowing that was going on in the streets that day during the Cuban crisis, all of that was involved with his association with the Afro-American Association. A lot of arguments came down. A lot of people were discussing with three or four cats in the Afro-American Association, which was developing the first black nationalist philosophy on the West Coast. They got me caught up. They made me feel that I had to help out, be a part and do something to help out some way. One or two days later, I went around looking for Huey at the school and I went to the library. I found Huey in the library and I asked him where the meetings were. He gave me an address and told me that there were book discussions. And then he told me the name of the book they were discussing at the time, which was Black Bourgeoisie. Huey was a large influence on the whole campus. I got to know where Huey was on campus. I wasn't a running partner of Huey's then, but I was catching him on the streets. We would all wig out behind Brother Huey, and I guess everybody respected Huey's mind and also Huey's guts. He had something about him, that he didn't drive over other people, but he would never let anyone drive over him, especially in a violent and rowdy fashion, because... I didn't know it at the time, but I learned later, Huey had a kind of hidden reputation on the block with the brothers. There were cats all over East and West Oakland who had reputations for being bad, and they were known throughout the community for being bad. Huey didn't have this kind of reputation. The bad cats terrorized the community, and Huey terrorized the bad cats. You heard a lot of stories about Huey, like one night at a party. Huey accidentally stepped on some brother's shoes, and Huey stepped back and said, Excuse me, brother. The brother, he was bad. One of those bad dudes. He said, Motherfucker, excuse me. Don't reshine my shoes. Huey knew his brothers very well. When the dude slid back to the side and dropped his arm slightly to the right, hanging behind his right thigh, Huey saw this. He knew this was the time to fire. Next thing you know, Huey fired on him and decked him. And all the other bad dudes at the party who were this deck dude's friends or partners wanted to know who this cat thinks he is. And so they jumped up and said that Huey needs his ass kicked. And Huey told them, I'll fight all of you one at a time or all of you at the same time. You won't wait outside for me. I'll be waiting outside for you. And then he walked outside and waited and dared them to come outside. And this is something I think Huey understood too, that he would shock them because he was as bad as the noted dudes in the area. He shocked them because he had nerve enough to fight all of them. They would come outside and think they could get around him or start sneaking around him to try to deck him. And the next thing you know, Huey would come out with a 14 or 15 inch machete and he'd be righteously trying to whip heads and cut up some ass. And he would have niggas running everywhere. Huey also used to get into fights with his partners who rode in his car with him. By the time he was coming out of high school and was around 16 and a half or 17, he had a car called the Gray Roach. Huey always hit a corner, his car speeding down the road. Once he turned the corner and a block up there was a railroad crossing with a little red light swinging, signaling that a train was coming. There was also a big building right on the corner that you couldn't see around. Huey started speeding up. He didn't know exactly where that train was, but he knew it was around that building somewhere. The next thing you knew, Huey had driven straight over that railroad crossing, and all the dudes in the car were cussing him out. He tried to tell them he couldn't die. He said he didn't believe he could die, and why die a thousand times when you only could die once? Then Huey stopped the car, and he and his partners got out to fight. Afterwards, they all got back in the car. He kept driving and his partners kept driving with him. I don't think Huey was trying to kill anybody. They were his partners. They rolled with him and they liked the cat. They fought, but they kept riding with him. They would say he was crazy when he did things like that. 
but they thought his mind was out of sight. Most important, Huey would defend his partners or whoever was with them. The brother was too much in his day, and all the cats knew it. I know some pimps and hustlers and righteous gangsters on the block who knew and respected Huey. Some of them were dudes Huey used to fight. He had gotten into some tight situations with some of them, and they knew that he'd vamp on them if they got wrong. One time, Huey walked into a liquor store to get some wine. You know how some brothers would be standing on the corner by the liquor store. He came back out and somebody said, Hey, nigga, give me some of that wine. Huey said, Brother, you can have some of my wine, but don't be asking me like that. Like you're going to take my wine. The dude launched the fire on Huey, so Huey stepped back and broke the bottle over his head. All the dudes were standing on the corner, just looking at this one dude Huey had fired on. This led to one of the baddest fights that ever happened in West Oakland. Huey and a real bad dude named McIlvain fought out there for half an hour. First Huey downed McIlvain, then McIlvain downed Huey. It was a standoffish thing because all of Huey's boys stood off and sat back, and all of McIlvain's boys did the same. I don't think McIlvain's boys wanted to mess with Huey's boys, so they got on the fences and on the cars and watched these two black men both brothers off the block thunder it out there in the street. They fought all across the street until they could hardly raise their hands to throw a lick. At one point, they were so tired that Huey would come up and get a couple of licks on McIlvain and down him. Then McIlvain would get up and down Huey. Huey thought he had downed him finally then walked away. He'd been drinking a lot of wine before the fight, so he got down on one knee in the middle of the street and started throwing up all his wine. The next thing he knew, he was seeing stars. He found out later that he'd been kicked in the head. McAlvain had gotten up without Huey noticing him. Huey felt himself rolling over the pavement, but he got up and came back at McIlvain and downed him again. Eventually, somebody called the pigs. That's the only thing that broke it up. The brother saw a pig car coming down the street, flashing its red light, and everybody split. Huey swore up and down that the next time he saw McIlvain, he'd kill him, and McIlvain swore that he was going to kill Huey. About three years later, Huey was walking down 7th Street in Oakland with a friend of his who had seen that fight. Huey's friend, Buddy, recognized McIlvain as they approached him, but Huey didn't. McIlvain had gotten a lot bigger. He'd been to the joint and had been throwing iron up there. Buddy looked at Huey and said, You know who this is, man? Huey said he didn't. Then Buddy looked at McIlvain and asked him, You know who this is here with me? Nah, said McIlvain. Then Buddy said, Man, you dudes don't know each other. They each shook their heads. So Buddy said, You niggas had one of the baddest fight that ever was fought in West Oakland. They looked at each other and McIlvain said, That's Newton, man? Damn. So Buddy said, Y'all ready to bury the hatchet now? Somehow or other, they agreed to bury the hatchet and forgot it and drank some wine together. When Huey was running around and living every day on the block with some of the toughest brothers, he was just as tough as the rest of them were. He fought it out with them and he survived in that environment. He was at school one day and somebody said something about some chick he was going with, some white boy, and Huey walked up to him and said, I don't want to hear anything more about my relations with this girl. White boy opened his mouth and Huey said, I said that I don't want you to say any more or make any statements about my relations with this particular girl. The white boy opened his mouth again and Huey decked him, laid him out on the basketball court on the campus there. And that's when I liked the brother. He was a brother to you to articulate things, explain things, and he could detect whether you were honest or dishonest to some extent or whether you were bullshitting or jiving. He's got some kind of intuition that he can detect this stuff about certain kinds of people. I could see Huey and say, man, loan me a dollar, and he let me hold a dollar. And he could see me and say, man, let me hold a couple of dollars. It was that kind of thing. I would run into him in a cafe or something, and he might be sitting down blowing about something. Anything from law to black nationalist philosophy and how we were interrelated to this system, the decadence of it, and he would be blowing facts. 
He wouldn't just be cleaning up the walls. And if you knew Huey and liked Huey, you would be pro-Huey when it came to an argument because you would know Huey was going to come up with some righteous facts, some righteous philosophical points of you to make you see what was going on. This is the way I saw him. and This is the way I've always thought of the cat. He's the kind of cat you always respect. He's a kind-hearted person. You can't use his kindness, but he'll give it away. So you look at him and say, what kind of cat is this? This brother here is something else. Huey breaks with the cultural nationalists. Among all the brothers, Huey was always respected for his insight. I've had a chance to meet a lot of the brothers he was partners with, and they always respected his ability, his perspective, and that he could explain things, how the system works against them. He could always give a valid reason why they were so right, why they were so right in whatever they did to try to survive. When Huey went to college, he never took over eight or nine units a semester, and he'd always make it a point to make A's or very good grades. But he didn't get the grades just because he was looking for a grade in college. Huey had a thing about going to school. It was an entertainment to his mind, but he explained the A's. A counselor told him when he got out of high school with D's, they more or less just rushed him through high school, that he wasn't supposed to be college material. His counselor told him, and he rejected the whole concept of these cats in these schools, these counselors, telling him that he wasn't college material. So I saw it as him entertaining his mind, as he says, and trying to grasp something and at the same time rejecting some white counselor, more than likely a racist, telling him that he couldn't do college. He always took six or seven units, and he always would go and get outside reading material. He would go forth to prove, give validity, by researching the references that any particular author might have made, and some particular materials they might be using in the school. So in the classroom, he was very up to date on things that were true and things that were false in any subject matter, and he could see whether the facts were valid. Intertwined with all these facts, of course, was the direct relation he had to black people, living in the confines of the decadent system. Black people surviving, black people knowing themselves, and black history. Huey took an experimental sociology course. I guess he'd been at Merritt a few years then. This experimental sociology course he was running down to me about how the course was for those in it to deal with some specific problem in society. And he swung the whole class to the need for black history in the schools. Huey P. Newton was one of the key people in the first black history course that was developed at Merritt College, along with many of the other people in the experimental sociology course. I remember him telling me about it, and I was enthused about it because I had been doing quite a bit of black history study myself. So come next semester, there was a Negro history course. I went and enrolled in the course and got Huey one day and asked him to come to the class because the class was all jammed up. The cat that was teaching it didn't know what he was doing. He wasn't really teaching black history. He was teaching American history and reiterating slavery and the period of slavery in the old traditional way they relate to black people in slavery. Here we come in the class one day, which was taught by Rodney Carlisle, a white instructor. Huey has always shot Carlisle down for his reference to Basil Davis and information concerning Africa and black mother and African slave trade. Set him down on the point of the piracy that initiated the slave trade. Huey gave inspiration to a lot of brothers and sisters to do a lot of in-depth study and realize the need to have knowledge of themselves as black people. About three years before this took place, I got into the Afro-American Association, and about two months later, Huey got out. I was wondering, why did Huey get out of the Afro-American Association? His partners, John Thomas and Richard Thorne, cats he knew around that time and ran with a lot were college students. These dudes weren't dudes off the block. They also got out of the African American Association. 
Huey began to explain how Donald Warden was using the Afro-American Association as a means to deceive black people. That Donald Warden was very up to date on a lot of historical facts and used these facts to make black people see his program as being right. But Huey had finally seen through Donald Warden's program and had seen through Donald Warden. One day in San Francisco, Fillmore Street, some white gang, a couple of stories up, began to hang out the window, hollering cuss words and bull crap. Some of them came downstairs. They got to acting like they were going to jump on somebody. Huey and another brother were there throwing hands and knocking cats on their ass while Donald Warden wouldn't help defend the principal. That's one thing about Huey, he stands on principles. Black nationalist philosophy at this time was interrelated with his principles. Somebody was going to try to jump on the brothers on the street corner where the Afro-American Association was holding a rally. Huey just went on and got out there and started throwing hands. And that's when he began to find Donald Warden out, I think. From there, he began to explain how Donald Warden was exploiting the old church thing. Preacher type attitude and concept to bring the people around and start talking about buy black business. This was the real split in terms of the black nationalist philosophy at the time. He saw that more cooperative socialistic type things were necessary for black people to use to oppose the system. He would explain many times that if a black businessman is charging you the same prices or higher, even higher prices than exploiting white businessmen, then he himself ain't nothing but an exploiter. So why should black people go for this kind of system? And he's always dealt with it in this fashion. Coming up on the ladder, there were some long periods of time I didn't see Huey. Then one day I saw Huey and he was talking about a case he just beat. He defended himself in court and had beaten a petty theft case. And he was running it down how he got Olson. Olson was the dean of Merritt College. Dean Olson had got up on the stand and testified to the fact that he had called the police in to have Huey P. Newton arrested and had the police bring Huey to his office because some patty boy over in the store had accused Huey of stealing a book. Huey explained to me that Olson had asked him if those were his books. Huey said, yes, this is my property right in front of the face of this cop and Olson said well I'll just keep those books and Huey said no you won't keep those books that's my property and I'll keep them myself you call me in the office for something I don't know what you want me for but I'll keep my property and Huey snatched the books back out of his hand and said if you want to arrest me you'll have to arrest me but I'm not going to stand here talking and he walked right on out of the office so the same thing came up on the stand, and Huey asked Olson on the stand, Dean Olson, why didn't you have me placed under arrest if you thought I had stolen the books? Huey was rapping, you know. If you ever catch him in court doing a law procedure, he raps just like he's a righteous lawyer. Dean Olson said, well, at that time, I just didn't know my rights as to whether or not I had the right to arrest you. Huey P. Newton looked at the jury, looked back at Dean Olson, and looked back at the jury and said, Mr. Olson, you're a dean at a college. Have a PhD in education. Here I am a student in the college, learning my rights, and you've got a PhD, and you tell me you didn't know your rights? Huey went on to explain the impact he made on the jury with that point and how they cut him loose. He became very, very famous, very well known, very notorious against anybody who done him wrong around the college. Well liked cat, well liked brother, very friendly with people, and Huey had very human qualities about himself. There's another thing about Huey. I remember one time there was some black nationalists, cultural nationalists on the campus who used to project all this cultural nationalism. Footnote. Cultural nationalists and black panthers are in conflict in many areas. Basically, cultural nationalism sees the white man as the oppressor and makes no distinction between racist whites and non-racist whites, as the Panthers do. The cultural nationalists say that a black man cannot be an enemy of the black people, while the Panthers believe 
that black capitalists are exploiters and oppressors. Although the Black Panther Party believes in black nationalism and black culture, it does not believe that either can lead to black liberation or the overthrow of the capitalist system. And a footnote. They were so engrossed in this cultural nationalism, they just hated white people simply for the color of their skin. This is where Huey and I got this thing about cultural nationalists. Huey had opened the door for his sister to go through. You know how a man opens the door for a woman. There happened to be a white girl coming right behind the sister. And so the white girl walked in. So one of the cultural nationalists ran up to him and said, How come you open the door for that white girl? And Huey turned around and looked at him. He said, look, man, I'm a human being and I'm not a fool. I opened the door for the sister. There happened to be a white girl behind her. The white girl's not attacking me. She's not brutalizing me. So there's nothing wrong with me keeping the door open for her to pass through too. And the cultural nationalists just went out of their mind, exaggerating the shit. That's just one point to show Huey's humanism toward all other human beings. This is the way he is. When I look back at some of the things that Huey was thinking at the time, and a lot of the things that Huey understood then, I knew that I didn't understand them at the time. But I followed Huey because he clarified these things to me. The Soul Students Advisory Council I had been running with some cultural nationalists for about two or three years. The so-called West Coast Underground, RAM, Revolutionary Action Movement. I got very frustrated with those cats. I didn't think they were going to do anything, and I became very discouraged about being able to work with them. They had a lot of paranoid hang-ups, and they began to accuse me of things. They had so many bullcrap suspicions, I couldn't deal with them. I broke loose from those cats. I got mad at them one night and busted down their door. All the niggas hid behind their damn beds. At that point, I couldn't deal with them anymore because they wouldn't defend themselves, even against one little old me. There were four or five of them in the pad, but they ran hiding. I just didn't respect them anymore. I was thinking to myself, later for these dudes, I'm going to find myself a righteous partner to righteously run with. I really hadn't seen Huey for over a year now. One night, I was just sitting on the street in front of James Oliver's house, about half a block up the street from Mary College, and Huey came by. I didn't know who it was at first. I was sitting there in the car, drinking a beer or something, and Huey flashed a little flashlight through the window. I think he recognized my car. I had seen him walking down the street a couple of times, but I think he knew I had that car. I said, what's happening, man? I said to myself, now this is who I ought to be running with. I had wanted Huey to be a part of the same cultural nationalist group I'd been running with, and these dudes didn't want Huey to be a part of the organization. At first, I couldn't figure out why, but I remember I had asked Huey to come up to the pad, and after he left, silly-ass Kenneth Freeman sat up and said some bullcrap about Huey P. Newton comes from a bougie family. Huey P. Newton was raised up righteously on the block, and of course, Kenny Freeman was the one who came from the Bourgeois family. He was also saying, The dude's high, man. I said, Well, what's the difference? He gets a little loaded off of something, and I drink whiskey. As I think about it, I don't think Kenny Freeman liked us field niggas too much. I don't think he dug us at all, because he knew Huey was the type of dude who didn't take no shit. And I figure he had a little egotistical, bourgeois fear about Huey kicking motherfuckers' asses and the way Huey articulates things. Huey came walking up that night with that flashlight and I said, this is who I need to be running with. Old brother Huey. This brother can righteously run it down and don't take no shit from nobody. This brother will stand with you and this is the way I felt about the brother, knowing him for those years that I had been knowing him. About four or five years by then, I started talking to the brother about the struggle, and I think he must have recognized that I was well frustrated with those cultural nationalists I'd been running with, the so-called underground RAM. 
One day I went over to his house and asked him if he had read Fanon. I'd read Wretched of the Earth six times. I knew Fanon was right and I knew he was running it down. But how do you put ideas like his over? Huey was laying up in bed, thinking, plotting on the man. I knew what he was doing. He used to tell me how he was plotting to make himself some money on the man. He was always involved with day-to-day -day survival like the average brother on the block. He said no, he hadn't read Fanon. So I brought Fanon over one day. That brother got to reading Fanon. And man, let me tell you, when Huey got a hold of Fanon and read Fanon, I had always been running down about how we need this organization, that organization, but never anything concrete. Huey'd been thinking hard. We would sit down with Wretched of the Earth and talk, go over another section or chapter of Fanon, and Huey would explain it in depth. It was the first time I ever had anybody who could show a clear-cut perception of what was said in one sentence, a paragraph, or chapter, and not have to read it again. He knew already. He'd get it on the streets. We'd be walking down the street and get it in some discussion with somebody, and throughout the process of this discussion and argument, Huey would be citing facts, citing that material, and giving perception to it. All that time he was giving the same basic concepts as he's giving now, but now he's in a wider and broader area because he's had a lot of experience and leadership in the Black Panther Party. His development now is at the head of the revolutionary struggle, but he always had this vast ability to do things along with a proper perspective, and he could run it down and get things going. Huey was one for implementing things. And I guess this is where the Black Panther Party really started. Because once Huey got hung on that, he started explaining how we had to get something going. Before the Black Panther Party came the Soul Students Advisory Council. Some of the other cultural nationalists in the college and the couple that I'd broken up with and got tired of messing with, they were driving to me and were still driving. Some of them came around. They were talking about starting some organization a school campus organization. Well, Huey and I got interested in the thing and a couple of other cats, Virtual Morel and Alex Papillion. We started talking about organizing what we named a little while later Soul Students Advisory Council. We structured the thing in such a way where we really practiced ultra democracy among ourselves. At the same time, Huey wanted to make the thing very meaningful. So the so-called central group of the Soul Students Advisory Council consisted of Virtual Morell, Alex Papillion, Bobby Seal, Huey P. Newton, Isaac Moore, and a couple of jive cultural nationalists around there. Huey and I decided we were going to try and make the thing work to develop a college campus group and to help develop leadership to go to the black community and serve the black community in a revolutionary fashion. I was with Huey all the way. So Soul Students was moving along and meanwhile Huey and I and Alex Papillion and Virtual Morell put out a lot of hard, hard, hard work getting a few things off the ground. The draft of black men was a big thing on the college campuses. Of course, just the draft itself became a high controversy. But we had just begun talking about the draft of black men. We organized one of the biggest rallies ever held at Mary College, where five or six hundred black people attended and ran it down. From there, Huey, Virtual, Alex, and myself were known as the leaders of the Soul Students Advisory Council. Huey and I and Weasel, one of the brothers on the campus, were all sitting in the car one night. We decided we wanted to buy some records by T-Bone Walker. Lightning Hopkins and Howlin' Wolf, these down-home brothers. I suggested that we go up to the Cal campus because up around there they have more LPs of T-Bone Walker, Howlin' Wolf, and all the brothers than they have in the regular black record shop. We started walking down the street on Telegraph toward the Forum, a restaurant up there. We were about a block from the Forum 
when the brothers asked me to recite one of the poems I always liked. One of them was named Burn Baby Burn. The other was Uncle Sammy Call Me Full of Lucifer. I was walking down the street reciting Burn Baby Burn all the way down till we got to the next block and then Huey and Weasel asked me to recite the other poem Uncle Sammy Call Me Full of Lucifer. So I got to reciting that poem. I said two or three words and when we got in front of the forum across the street one of the brothers, Weasel, got over and picked a chair up. It's kind of a sidewalk restaurant. He said, here Bobby stand on this. So we set the chair up by the curb there and I got on the chair and hollered, Uncle Sammy call me full of Lucifer. When I said that I went on to recite the rest of the poem. Then someone said, do it again, run it down again man. So I got to the part of the poem where it said, you school my naive heart to sing red, white, and blue stars and striped songs. Some uniformed pig cop walked up. He stood around 10 or 12 feet away. I said, you school my naive heart to sing red, white, and blue stars and striped songs and to pledge eternal allegiance to all things blue, true, blue-eyed, blonde, blonde-haired, white chalk, white skin, with USA tattooed all over. Man, when I said that, this cop walks up and says, You're under arrest. I got down off the chair, said, What are you talking about? You're under arrest. Under arrest for what? What reason do you have for saying I'm under arrest? And he says, You're blocking the sidewalk. And I say, What do you mean I'm blocking the sidewalk? I'm standing over here. I noticed Huey standing to my left. Next thing I know, some people started grabbing on me. You're under arrest. You're under arrest. I started snatching away from them, man. Next thing I know, Huey was battling up there, and three patties had me down, tied down onto the ground. One of the patties that had hold of me, Huey knocked him in the head a couple of times, and a couple of other brothers stomped on the patties. I got loose. A big fight was going on. But boy, they say Huey whipped up some motherfuckers up there. They say Huey was throwing hands. That's why I say Huey or his partners, he always went down with them. It's just one of them things he just relates to any brothers he's with. He doesn't let anybody mess over his partners or whoever he's running with. That's the way he is. That's the way he is with his people against this racist decadent system. That's the way he gets with any human being who tries to hurt him or his friends and his people and his family. That was a big thing. Huey and I got busted that night. I fooled around and got busted a block away from the thing. Since we were the leaders of the Soul Students Advisory Council at the time, and Huey and I had to have a lawyer, Virtual Morell went to the SSAC Treasury, got $50, and gave us 25 apiece to secure ourselves lawyers after we got bailed out. It took us three days to get Huey bailed out of jail. He was on probation. And at first his probation officer put a hold on him, but later cut the hold loose. Three weeks after Huey was bailed out, some brother got busted right in front of our car. Huey was getting ready to vamp on the pigs because he knew the brother wasn't doing a thing. He was a citizen, just standing around observing, about 10 or 12 feet away from our car, and the cops went up to him and wanted to bust him for nothing. Huey said, We got some money in the SSAC treasury. We're going to bail this brother out. Me and Alex Papillion held Huey back. More pigs came up and they made me and Alex line up against the wall and drew pistols on us. Then they arrested the brother who had just been standing around. So we went and bailed the brother out. We were going to use the SSAC to begin learning how to serve our community. The brother got busted on the bullshit tip for no reason. Bail the brother out, we said. We hit the streets. A short while later, we had a meeting of the SSAC involving about 200 people who were very concerned about where the SSAC were going. The cultural nationalists had spread it around all over the campus that we were doing the council wrong. They accused us of stealing money from the treasury. In fact, money wasn't stolen. It was being used for bail and to secure lawyers for me and Huey. 
The cultural nationalist also accused us of accepting money from a white man. We got the money from Bob Shear, a former Ramparts editor who was running for Congress. Shear had come up and asked us for support. And we said we didn't feel it was necessary to support anybody in the political arena because we didn't think they could voice our opinions adequately. We asked Shear for a hundred dollars which he gave us. There weren't any strings attached to the money. We just said we need one hundred dollars to help get things off the ground here at Merritt College. We felt we knew what we wanted to do because Huey had already run it down to the central group of the SSAC that we had to arm ourselves. This was way before we organized the Black Panther Party, maybe 11 months before. Huey had run it down to Douglas Allen, to Isaac Moore, to Kenny Freeman, and to Ernest Allen, that what we needed to do was to involve the black community. Huey understood the meaning of what Fanon was saying about organizing the lumpen proletariat first, because Fanon explicitly pointed out that if you didn't organize the lumpen proletariat, if the organization didn't relate to the lumpen proletariat and give a base for organizing the brother who's pimping, the brother who's hustling, the unemployed, the downtrodden, the brother who's robbing banks, who's not politically conscious, that's what lumpen proletariat means. That if you didn't relate to these cats, the power structure would organize these cats against you. Huey said to all these cats on the Central Committee of the SSAC that we are going to have to show the brothers on the block that we have an organization that represents the community and we're going to have to show it in a real strong fashion. So Huey suggested to the Central Group that we bring these brothers off the block, openly armed, and to the campus and bring the press down. We could reach the community because the press would be hungry for it and show them on Malcolm X's birthday, May 19th, that Malcolm X had advocated armed self-defense against the racist power structure and show the racist white power structure that we intend to use the guns to defend our people. All these cultural nationalists, these underground ram bastards, all of them, were scared and rejected it. And I even have to say that virtual morale wasn't too hot on it. Even Alex Papillion wasn't too hot on it. The only people hanging on to it were Huey P. Newton leading it and me following Huey P. Newton because I dug Brother Huey. Because I felt I knew what the hell he was talking about. Because at this time, he was explaining to me that you implement through practice, not just through a bunch of words, what Fanon was talking about. Huey was running down that the law says that every man has the right to arm himself by the Second Amendment of the Jive-Ass Constitution of the United States. He says that we are going to exhaust that because in the end, the man will say that we don't have a Second Amendment of the Constitution. That's very important to understand. So when Huey said, let's exhaust it now, he meant relate specifically to what Malcolm X was thinking. Don't relate to the personality of Malcolm so much and relate more to what Malcolm X was saying to do. This is what Huey was trying to implement within the confines of the soul students quite a while before the Black Panther Party got started. All these cats rejected it. Douglas Allen, the rest of them, they were scared. They were shook. Huey defined them as a bunch of scared cowards. This is when we really, really began to pick our bone with these cultural nationalist cats in the SSAC. They accused us of stealing money and then rejected this idea about the guns and arming the people. They started accusing us and they were trying to act bad on the campus like they were bad dudes off the block. You get these cultural nationalists that think they're bad. They think they're better than anybody else. So Huey says, if they think they're bad, we're going to get our shit. I had a 9 millimeter pistol, and Huey called up his boys, the pimps, thugs off the blocks. People always called them thugs. And he called up his nephew, who, like the brothers on the block, just liked to fight. They don't like to do much of anything but fight. And they liked Huey, and they respected Huey's ideas. So we stacked the whole session there, that whole last day session. That was the day Huey and I resigned from the SSAC. 
with the brothers off the block and Huey said, Come on up here. These niggas think they're bad. We're going to show them if they're bad. We came off in there and we had guns and sweaters and shit. Buddy Boy was there with a couple of his boys and one of Huey's nephews with his nine or ten brothers off the block and some more of his cousins. We were going to kick ass that day. But the cultural nationalists sloughed it off and got pissed off and scared because they knew we meant business. Huey was in the back room and I was up there, standing around 10 or 12 feet from Isaac Moore. Isaac Moore started talking about telling me to sit down. I told him, you come over here and make me sit down, because I knew I had a 9mm for his ass. Isaac Moore was supposed to know a little bit of karate, but if he got acting bad, I was going to prove to that nigga that karate don't do the chop buck shots and pistol bullets. Huey was in the back room, and he asked Kenny Freeman to come out of the corner. And Kenny Freeman backed his ass up, sat down, and kept quiet. Because, you know, Huey P. Newton was a motherfucker. He doesn't like anybody to fuck over his friends. Huey has a thing. He gives. He's true, he's fair, and he likes to give. But he won't let nobody fuck over that. And that's what Kenny Freeman was trying to do. Fuck over the fact that Huey was giving things out. Huey never lets anybody mess over anything that he's ready to give to the people or give to anyone. That is, his fairness, his trueness. Kenny Freeman couldn't understand that Huey was ready to give and Huey's dedication was to the people. They talked all that shit about us stealing money and swayed the Jive College intellectuals to think we were stealing money. We told the fuckers we ain't stealing money. That we took the money and bailed out one brother and Virtual Morell said, I took 50 and gave 25 to Huey P. Newton and 25 to Bobby to secure themselves a lawyer for that shit that happened up on Telegraph. The cultural nationalists have their minds so fucked up in the system and in pawn to the system that they couldn't believe it. They didn't want to believe it. They wanted to be treacherous and chicken shit like the power structure with their minds and pawn to the system. That's how they have a tendency to project themselves. So Huey and I jumped up and we said, well, fuck it, we resign. We're going to the black community and we intend to organize in the black community and organize an organization to lead the black liberation struggle. Huey ran all that down to them. We don't have time for you, he said. You're jiving in these colleges. You're hiding behind the ivory wall towers in the college and you're shucking and you're jiving. This was the real break with the SSAC that Huey established. So we left and said, later for the punks, job motherfuckers at the college. We just went to the streets where we should have been in the first place. Those four or five years that preceded, they showed us that. And Huey, the brother off the block, had never really left the streets at all. When we decided to go to the streets, it was all based basically on one thing that Huey P. Newton was ready to go to the streets. Before Huey decided to leave college, he had wanted to implement things there and educate those on the college level to the necessity of bringing the brothers off the block to the college level and relating those college skills to the streets. This was Huey's objective because he saw the necessity of this happening. But at the same time, Huey also realized that if the college boys didn't want to come on the streets, later for them. And that's how it happened. The college boys, the cultural nationalists, all the bullshit, jiving dudes who articulate bullshit all the time and don't ever want to get into the real practice of revolutionary struggle, the black liberation struggle in this country, Huey'd say, well, later for them, we'll go to the streets. And I'd say, Huey, I'm with you, brother. Let's go and do it. So we went out onto the streets, and that was it. All the passages that Fanon has covered, Huey covered. We used to underline them. I wish I had the books right now with the passages we underlined. Everything that Fanon said about violence and the spontaneity of violence, how spontaneous violence educates those who are in a position with the skills to lead the people to what needs to be done. Fanon ran the cultural nationalists down cold. He talked about them like they were dogs. This is why many of the cultural nationalists 
have really, in fact, thrown Fanon's book to the side. Malcolm X talked about organization and doing things and righteously going out there and doing it. The cultural nationalist, on the one hand, wanted to sit down and articulate, while Huey P. Newton wanted to go out and implement stuff. This is very important. This is the difference, the line of demarcation, in fact, between the revolutionaries and those who are jiving in the confines of the ivory walls, the ivory towers of the college. Huey and I began to talk about a lot of things. We really began to get very intense in how this thing was going to go and how we thought it should go. We had been rejected by people at San Francisco State, Merritt College, and on the Berkeley campus because we talked and emphasized the necessity of arming the people with guns. The cultural nationalists and many of the leading white liberals, they look at it like, you can't pick up guns. It's impossible to pick up guns. This is what they want to emphasize. This is what you could infer from all their rhetoric. But Huey said, no, you must pick up guns because guns are key. Using the poverty program. In June 1966, the summer before the Black Panther Party was actually organized, I took a job at the North Oakland Neighborhood Anti-Poverty Center as a foreman in the summer youth work program. The job paid $660 or $670 a month. I had previously worked in a poverty program and had been fired because I was teaching the youth black history and teaching them not to be sucked in by the $1.35 an hour that they were given. I tried to get them not to think in Uncle Thomas ways, but always to think in ways related to black people in the black community surviving and black people in the black community unifying. Through working in the poverty programs, I was able to meet a lot of the young cats who would later become lumpen proletarians. The same summer, Huey was a community organizer, so Huey and I were together quite often. Huey knew quite a few of the older cats in the community. Because of his articulateness, he was always welcomed by the brothers in the community who were generally referred to as hoods and criminals. This summer work program provided jobs for about 100. 25 girls and 75 boys. They worked in the community cutting lawns, cutting hedges, digging up grounds, etc. They were supposed to do repairs on fences and steps and things like that, but the equipment wasn't available. There were four such programs, so only 400 kids were employed by the poverty program in Oakland. My objective in the program was to teach black American history if I could and teach them also some degree of responsibility not teach them responsibility in old establishment terms but in terms of their own people living in the community. In the poverty program the young brothers many times would try to be slick and think they were pimps or think they could out gamble or out talk or out rap anybody. Some of them would fool around and carry knives and I'd have to hit them about the knife carrying. In working with the poverty program I never wanted to use the authoritarian type old school tactics which I had rejected and I knew these young brothers rejected. They drank wine, shot dice and things like that. I knew there was a way to reach these brothers because I wasn't too much different from them. I knew how to drink wine, how to shoot dice, play cards and chase women. Sometimes I caught cats playing cards and I have to make them stop. I'd say you cats can't play cards man because you got a job to do. But generally, I refused to be authoritarian. I did a lot of things that weren't conventional. I tried to make the brothers understand that they had a right to set a price on their labor. I knew that in the future, they probably would be workers, especially if we ever changed this system. If I had 10 cats on a job, I would say, all right, you got six hours of work today. You get one hour for lunch. Now, if all you cats get together and do this job, you can do it in four hours. I know you can do it easily in four hours. Then I'd say, I'll let you off for the next two hours, and I'll see to it. You still get your pay for the entire six. The administrators up there probably didn't know what I was doing, but I was trying to make the young cats respect their labor. At the same time, I was trying to make them respect responsibility and to go ahead and do things. This is related a lot to my past. When I was younger, about 13 or 14 years old, my mother would say, 
make up the bed and clean your room. My brother and I would loll around for half an hour or 45 minutes trying to sneak outside and trying to get out of it. Then one day I figured it out and I said, Hell, we could have cleaned up the room in 10 or 15 minutes, made the bed up and been gone. I was using this discovery I had made as a kid to show these brothers that with the labor they produce, if they really get on it and get down to it, they could really do the job. Every once in a while, I catch a lazy cat. When I catch one, I go to where he was working and go right to work. And we work real, real hard and really start getting things cleaned up. Instead of trying to dock the pay or fire the lazy cat, I get all the other brothers together. And by me working too, I try to show them. Then the rest of the brothers would be falling behind me and they would ridicule the lazy cat. This was a means by which a lot of the cats could begin to see that they could get things done. Mr. Allen, the director of the program, came from the old school, very strict and very hard. He wanted to do right, but his ideas and his notions related to old conservative people. In essence, they say, do what the system says to do and you'll be all right. But that isn't the truth at all. Sometimes Mr. Allen would find things out and he would dock a cat's pay. The young brothers really try to be slick. They try to run jive games and they don't realize that all the people aren't foolish. The very first day I got all the cats in the room and the first thing I did was run down a little black history to them. I kind of stimulated their interest a little and I recited Burn Baby Burn by Marvin Jackman. The poem was a catchy little thing but a lot of cats were never able to explain that poem in terms of the political, social, and economic repression of black people. The poem's meaning is that the soul of a black man must bring up enough courage to rebel and resist. If they understood that poem, they would begin to have revolutionary political ideology. They would see, as the Black Panther Party has, that spontaneous uprising are not what's happening. But, as Fanon said, violence can be a strength and a weakness. The violence of the many riots that occurred before the Black Panther Party was conceived was a strength in producing an organization like the Black Panther Party and also made other organizations more determined to seek a better, more revolutionary ideology to guide the people. They could see that so many people were getting killed just because they were without organization. Well, I more or less explained that poem to the brothers and sisters. I recited the poem, and they checked it out. Then I recited, Uncle Sammy called me full of Lucifer. This is by a cat named Ronald Stone back in New York. I recited these poems to the brothers in a very dramatic way. Then I explained to them that this is the reason the man has really got you down and you're making $1.35 an hour. All you cats who are from 16 to 21, I said, he's paying you $1.35 an hour because he knows your soul. He knows that you have moved to resist the system. I'm trying to show you that you don't have to move to resist the system in that fashion anymore. They dug the poem. On Saturdays, there was an education thing for an hour or two, and then there was a baseball game. The young cats would get paid for coming to the four-hour session on Saturdays. After the early morning education class, some cats wouldn't go play baseball. They'd sit down and start playing blackjack or some other card game. Bobby Hutton was one of those cats. I first met little Bobby when a friend of his brought him around and asked me if I could get him a job. I said, yeah, there's three or four more spots open down there. They ought to have enough money to give you a job. Bobby said he was 16 years old, but I knew he wasn't 16. I could tell by his face. But I said, I'll just say he's 16 and let him have his job because he needs a job. His partner had told him, we got a foreman that's something else. This is what I heard. And his partner said, I know he'll give you a job. He really digs all the brothers. One Saturday, nobody in that whole program wanted to play baseball. So I said, well, you cats can't gamble without me. I know all of you are thinking you can out gamble me, so let's get down to it then. They were betting nickels and dimes. Now, what are you gambling for anyway? I said, you don't need to be gambling because the whole operation is always against you. 
Oh man, you don't know what you're talking about, baby. You're just one of those jive squares, Bobby. So you think gambling is where it's at, huh? I said, so I thought to myself, nah, I don't believe these brothers are too hip. I'm going to have to teach them just a little bit of a lesson. They were playing blackjack, so I got in the game. A nickel and a dime, a nickel and a dime. Then I said, let's raise the stakes. Let's raise the stakes, baby. I can't win no money, man. You cats are making big money. The cats were just sitting there. A quarter, man, a quarter, I said. What kind of gamblers are you? Are you all tight, tensey, jive gamblers? So the cat who had the deal said, Bet a quarter if you want a better quarter. I said, Bet a half. He said, Bet a half. I said, Right on time. I hit down and bet a half. And I lost about 15 halves. Finally, I got the deal. I had lost almost all of the $10 I had with me. So I said, All right. Who's going to go against me with this piece of money? I had 75 cents on me. I said, here's 75 cents right here. One of the brothers says, I'll go. I said, all right, let's deal one hand. Boom. We dealt one hand and I won it. I said, who's going to go with me against this dollar fifty? Everybody's saying, this motherfucker. They were thinking that I had to lose. I could have lost, but I had a little piece of luck. I won, and I built the pile up to about $5. I said, all right now, the sky's the limit. Anybody can bet anything they want to, anything they want. The cat ran out of money. He said, I want to play payday stakes. Payday stakes? I said, I'll take anything. I'm taking all bets coming in this way, right here. Coming around the board, baby, can you hear me? I ran it on down and flipped all the cards out. That's when I really started winning. But I lost the damn deal. So I lost the deal. And the game is spirited. With payday stakes. So I said the sky's the limit. One cat was going to be slick. What will you bet? He asked me. I'll bet a hundred dollars. I said the other cat said right on time. That old Bobby makes that old six fifty a month. I'm going to get me some of that money. One hundred dollars. hundred dollars. I said boom. I won. This cat didn't want any more part of it. So I went down to another cat and I got him. I went and played a few more hands. I was running the game and things were getting tight with the little change they had left on them. I finally caught another cat. I said, $100. I lost. Bet another 100 I said, I lost. Payday stakes, I said. Bet another 100 I lost. I lost. I lost five more hands. I was about $700 in debt. This cat... Had a grin all over his face, man. He didn't know what to do. So he just giggled. And all the other dudes, they wanted to deal because they figured I was a fool. We went on again. Payday stakes. $100. Lost again. Payday stakes. $100. Lost once more. Then I got a blackjack and won back the deal. Payday stakes, I said. Oh, man. They all said, oh, man, nothing. I said, I played payday stakes with you. Now you can play payday stakes back with me. I make the most money anyway in this thing. Now what are you guys going to do? Sit up here and jive like a bunch of little jive chicken shit squirming? Or are you going to gamble like men? You say you can gamble. I was really going to teach them a lesson then. Because I was always going to outbet them. We went way out to the benches in the middle of the park. We sat down and really started gambling. We had about 15 cats there. All the cats who thought they were slick wanted to gamble. I kept the deal, and after a while, I must have had two of them $2,000 in debt to me. So I told the cats, now you're gamblers, aren't you? They said, yeah. Now see what I've been doing to you cats, I said. I've been out betting you. I had one cat there, $1,000 in the hole. What you need to do is bet $2,000 next time. Bet $2,000, man, I said. Come on, all you cats that are in the hole there. Come on now, some of you got to win. Now I've got you $600 in the hole. I pointed at one. You 500 you 300 I had all these cats in the hole. And I told them they had to righteously bet. So the cats upped their bets. And I won every hand, man. 
I won every hand. They didn't want to play anymore. I said, come on, man, what's the matter? They got the jiving. I don't make as much money as you do. I can't pay that kind of money. You're going to pay me. I said, don't be jiving me. You're going to pay me because I get your text. I'm the one who gives you your text. You understand that? I'm the one who puts hours on the books. I was serious with them too. I sounded very serious with them. And I said, all right, all right. I might cut it down on some of you because I know you can't pay it. But you cats are going to pay me. You're going to pay me every bit of it. I don't want to have no shit out of none of you. Man, they were kind of teed off. Payday was coming up that Monday. They got paid twice a month on the 15th and the last of the month. So when payday came, I got them all together. I had their names written down in the book. I had their checks put aside especially. Come on, brothers. I said, let's go. Get in the truck. Get in the truck. I put them all on the special crew and took them all down to the bank and handed their checks out. I said, all right now, you owe me uh, $2,000, right? The cat says, yeah. All right. I said, I want half of your check. And that will be the end of the debt. Really, man? Yeah. I said, the end of the debt. Now, here's your check. Cash it. So what I did was prorate everybody who owed me less than that. Some cats only wound up paying me a couple of dollars. But the thing is, after that I told them, Now don't be gambling no more. The house will beat you. I've been to Reno. I know, man. The house will beat you. That's going to teach you a lesson. I took that money and donated it back and turned it toward a big party they had. That with some of the cats who were 21 years old, I bought them all beer they wanted for the rest of the summer. Another time, I caught some of them drinking wine on the job. I saw two of them sitting in a car and sipping from a bottle. I called to the brother who was supervising the job. I said, hey man, you see these dudes right here? They were sitting out there hiding the wine bottle. You see these dudes, man? The cat who was supposed to be supervising looks at me. Man, I said, these punks are sitting up here jiving and fucking off, man, and they're not doing any work, and it's your fault. But the most killing thing about it is that they have some wine in the car, man. The supervisor thought I was getting halfway serious, but he knew me a little bit, so he started laughing and grinning. I said to the dudes in the car, okay, now open the door and get out of that car. I told the supervisor, the 21-year-old cat, I said, these cats have this wine and wouldn't give us any. They wouldn't give us a bit, man. So now that they've drunk half the wine out of the bottle, the rest belongs to me and you. Doesn't it, brother? He agreed. Is that all right with you, brother? I asked one of the dudes who had been drinking. He says, yeah, man, okay. So we checked around and we drank the wine. Then we said, everything's all right. You all can go back to work. All right? It said, all right, man. This was toward the beginning of the job. They thought that I was going to turn them in. What I was trying to do was show the brothers that they have to take more responsibility. But I was trying to do it with a different technique instead of pouncing on their heads. I knew that those kids had been drinking wine before they ever met me. When you roll it in on them fast like the authorities do and beat their heads and put them down, they only want to do it more. So the thing was to catch them with the wine and let them know that they weren't being slick, that they weren't hiding it from anybody, and have them go back to work. Now if I had thrown the wine away and spilled it all on the ground, the cats would have hated me. I'd have despised the cat who threw all the wine away myself. This is the kind of general relationship that I built up with the brothers. Some of the brothers who got caught doing different things got docked on their pay occasionally. Sometimes I'd leave the pay docked, but a lot of times I'd take the docked pay off if I saw that the cat was really trying to go ahead and do his work. One of the more significant things I tried to do was to get the dudes to do the jobs real quick and do them efficiently. This would leave some time over to sit down and talk about the history of black people and the experience of black people and how the system was really against us and how we had to grow up and be more functional.
Bobby Hutton originally said he didn't want to go back to school, but through the summer program, I talked him into going back. Of course, when he did go back to school, he got kicked out again. I was still working on another job down at the same poverty center, and he came up and told me. I talked him into going back a second time, but a week or so later, he got kicked out again. He asked me to get him a job in the poverty center, so I said, yeah, that would be better than running the streets, because that's what's going to happen to you, man. The pigs busted him one day, and he told them that he was trying to get a job down at the corner, and the pigs dropped him off in front of the poverty office. I happened to be out there. I told them, yeah, I'm trying to get him a job here. I think they busted him with a beer can or something, so I got the head supervisor at the place to get him a job. Some of the other brothers in that program were among the initial members of the party, but Bobby Hutton was the first member of the Black Panther Party. What was significant to me about that summer program was that I had built up such a good relationship with the young brothers. One of the things that hurt that poverty operation was that they were always trying to get the kids to do things by pulling that authoritarian stuff. They were citing the Marquise of Queensbury's rules and stuff like that. And half of those brothers couldn't even read. Some of them were already out of high school. Some of them were dropouts and some of them had already graduated. The 18 year olds and the 19 year olds. But many of them couldn't read. Trying to teach those cats was tough. Most of the sisters could read. The brothers could read words like this, that, did, done, days though, etc., but their general reading level wasn't any higher than that. Most of the brothers were from the streets. They wanted to be slick. They wanted to be pimps. They were trying to get them at peace from some of the sisters all the time. It was hard, but I was able to encourage them to go and sit in the writing and reading classes that went along with the program. The work crews had to come in for a certain number of hours. They'd go to a class for an hour or two and go back out. I tried to give them some insight into the values of reading and the values of learning, along with black history. I tried to help the cats understand that it was all related. Police Community Relations Our best experience in dealing with the power structure in that program came when somebody in the Department of Human Resources downtown set up a tour of police headquarters for our center. Mr. Allen, the head of the program, said, Mr. Seal, the young ladies and fellows on the whole crew here will be going down to police headquarters tomorrow. That was Friday. I said, police headquarters? He said, yeah, they have a tour down there and they want them to come down and tour the police station so they can understand the city government better and so the police department can establish better human relations with the community. Well, I said, okay, I'll see to it that they all get down there tomorrow. I thought to myself, if these brothers and sisters get down there and get to talking with too many of those policemen, those cats are going to get themselves busted. I knew they were always in and out of jive petty crimes. A lot of times I put them on jobs somewhere in town a crew of 10 or 12 and they might try to shoplift from a corner store or something like that. One time I had to go in and talk the man into not having them arrested because they had been in there stealing, stealing the man's stuff when they had money in their pockets. I had to show them that it wasn't necessary to be ripping things off when they had money in their pockets. Petty crimes can jack you up, I told them. Not that I'm on the side of the system, I said, but when you got something going for yourself, you should use that as a functional thing as much as you possibly can. The next day, I thought I'd drop back by there because I knew these brothers. They'd go down there and steal even if they had $50 in their pockets. So I drove by there, and sure enough, there were two of them in the store. No sooner do I walk in than I saw somebody sticking a bag of cookies up under his belt. The cat came outside. I say, hey man, come here. I thought I told you, man, not to be jiving around here, jiving and stealing. 
This old man wants nothing more than to arrest you cats on a bull's hit tip. Then I asked him, Now how much money have you got on you? I'll buy you a bid. Tell me how much you've got on you. Oh man, what's wrong with you, man? You out of your mind? No, I'm not out of my mind, man. You ain't got sense enough to see that this old stupid man here is going to get some cop. I pulled on his coat and took the cookies back to the man. Then I said to the cat, now come over here, walk back there and apologize to the man. Man, you out of your mind? He turned around and walked out. I thought to myself, well maybe I shouldn't have done that. So I went out there and said to him, Look man, maybe I was wrong in telling you to apologize, but what I'm trying to do is keep the man from calling up. He's mad, man. He wants to call up and bust nine or ten of you cats who are working down here. I got another job up the street from this place. I said nine or ten more cats are going to be working in this general area. You all are going to come to this job store and the next thing I know you all are going to get busted on a tip because you don't have sense enough to see that you've got money in your pocket and cookies don't cost that much. Yeah I guess you are right Bobby. You are right man. I'm a fool. I say you sure are if you keep that up brother. Right, they said and split. We had to go down to the police station on Friday, so I got everybody together Thursday evening. I went around to all the jobs and picked up half the cats. Look, tomorrow you cats are going down to the police station for a tour. I said, the cats say, police station? They said, that really turned office. Yeah, man, I said. Bobby, what you doing, man? Man, it ain't me. I said, I don't want to go down to no job police station. Some of the sisters said, Shoot, I don't want to be going way down there to see old fools. But one little girl said, I want to go down there. I want to see what it's like. Half of them wanted to go, and half of them didn't. The half that did want to go, wanted to go just out of curiosity. Well, we're going anyway, I said. This is one of the tours, and you cats have got to go, so we'll go. But when you get down there, don't be talking to no policemen. They're going to try to ask you questions. I know these cops. They're going to try to ask you questions in some kind of way about yourself, gangs, and people in the community so they can focus in on you cats. That's trying to use you like Germany used little kids, I told them, although it's not that heavenly organized. But I know them. Don't answer any questions. Just observe things there and whatever the tour is about. I don't know what it's about, but I'll be with you. All right, man. Right, I said. Right, okay, man. Beautiful. We bust down to the police station the next day. We went inside, and they took us into a big room. A kind of police room. It had a lot of chairs in it. Some lieutenant, who was the head of the juvenile division, was sitting up there along with the chief of police. This lieutenant jumped up and said, Well, it's good to have all of you here. Come down and see the police station. We've got a lot of things you're going to see today. You'll be able to go up to the crime museum. You'll see the firing range. And go around and see the communications operations here. His voice was real coppish-like. And the communication section upstairs and generally look over the police department. Because this is all related to establishing our... Uh, it wasn't in a human tone at all. And uh, establishing community relations with the people and the communities and uh, and uh, and uh, so that we can better get along in our society. Then this cop went right off into it. I know a heck of a lot of you guys out there are in gangs. Now he sounded real toughish like he went on. And a lot of you are in different organizations and groups. And, uh, I want to ask a few of you some questions. I noticed the other three or four cops in the room. They got pads out sitting up there. They got pads out. There was another one sitting over off to the side, and he had a notepad sitting on his lap. I said to myself, these motherfuckers. And, uh, a lot of rioting. Things been going on, and, uh, some of you guys are good guys. 
you know we got some good jobs down there for you guys this summer. And uh, if you know any guys who've been running around here looting and things like that, we want you to uh, give us their names and uh, the names of the different organizations and groups out there. And, uh, and uh, let us know where they're staying. And I jumped up and said, hold it, hold it, hold it right there. I said, not one word. Don't you brother say a word. Don't anybody say nothing. This cop looked at me and I looked at him and I said, no siree. Well, he said, this is just part of the tour. No, uh uh. You ain't gonna jack these cats up here like that, I said. You got them informing on other people in the community, and half of the cats are getting shot and brutalized when you cops go pick them up. No, siree. You're not going to turn us into no operation where the police department makes us inform on ourselves. You're talking about community relations? This ain't no community relations operation. This is a job criminal investigation. You're not going to use them to do it. We know how to start encouraging these brothers to stop committing crimes and things like that. And how to organize them to teach themselves. But we're not going to have this. They didn't like that man. So Mr. Allen came in and said. Seal I think you should let the officer continue. I said, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So he tried again, this cop. Well, has anybody got anything to say out there? Nobody said a thing. Well, does anybody have any questions about the police department? Silence. Does anybody have any questions? Nobody said nothing. If anybody's got any questions about the police department, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and we can talk and have some general discussion here. Nobody would piss a drop. The brothers and I and the sisters, we all had that together. They weren't saying a thing. Then the police walked out. And the chief of police walked over and talked to Mr. Allen. They walked outside. As I walked down the aisle, I spotted a brother over to my left. This cat had a big, big old long switchblade. He had the blade down on his lap, but he was cleaning his fingernails with it, with this big long switchblade, about four and a half inches long. God damn, I said to myself, sitting right up here in the middle of the police station. I walked over and I bent down and whispered to him. Brother. Yeah, Bobby, he said. What is it, man? Don't raise your hands up, keep them down, I said. And close that knife and put it in your pocket. Man, do you realize you're sitting right in the police station? And you've got an illegal knife on you? And when you get home, man? I said, leave that thing in your house. What's wrong with you? Yeah, man, okay, I'm sorry. You, you right, man, you right. He got kind of shaky there. He realized that he could get busted on a bullshit tip. Some of the other brothers next to him heard us talking and they started giggling. Ha, <laughs> ha, you damn fool. They ridiculed each other a lot. So I said, you ain't got no business calling him no fool because you had probably done the same thing. Why don't you cats stop laughing at each other? Then they called me outside and the lieutenant said, well, Bobby, uh, it seems like you've got things under control here. Uh, don't you want to let us ask any questions? Mr. Allen said, Bobby, uh, I mean, uh, you have to let them ask questions. You have to tell those kids out there. I know they like you and everything, Bob, but uh, you have to uh, at least let them ask questions. Uh, let these officers here see if they have anything to investigate. Well, I'm not going for the investigation, Mr. Allen. I said because the way police departments work, half of the stuff they get is trumped up. They're trumped up because one kid will say, Joe might have done this, Jim might have done that. Most kids don't know what they're saying, and they don't know anything about the law. The police try to say, well, we're trying to teach them about the law. No, you're not teaching them about the law, I said, and we got into a little argument right there. You're not teaching nothing about the law. Not one of them probably has ever opened their penal code book. They don't generally know what a law is or what law is being broken. 
Some of them are wrong. Some of them do illegal things, maybe. But I don't see any reason for you railroading them. You police departments work erroneously anyway, I told them. Because what you cats do is get skimpy information here and skimpy information there. And Joe said that. And Joe said this. And Jim said this. And Jack said that. And the next thing you know, half the cats you have arrested haven't even committed real crimes or any specific crime that you're trying to charge them with. Because what's his name will mention such and such a person's name on such and such a night. That's what you're trying to get these cats in there into, and I'm not going to let them do it. We're together. We're going to stick together. Even if you fire me, Mr. Allen, I know I'm right because I'm protecting them. Then Mr. Allen said, Well, I still think that the kids should ask some questions to go along with the community relations program. I said, All right, we'll let them ask a few questions, but I'll go with you to tell them. So what I did, instead of telling them, go ahead and ask questions. I said, do you guys want to ask questions here or not? One of the brothers said, oh man, I don't want to ask no questions here. So I said, well, we'll see what we can do about setting up something because I still think that you brothers have something to say about what the police do in our communities instead of always letting them dictate to us. Somebody said, that's right, because a whole lot of stuff has happened, man, that I know about that a whole lot of these police have done here. All the brothers were saying, yeah, yeah. They were carrying on, man. I said, all right, hold it, hold it, hold it. I raised my hands up. They always got quiet when I said, hold it. I said, all right, I'll talk to this lieutenant some more and see what else we can set up in the future. I went over and said, Mr. Allen, why don't you just let them finish the tour and if we just work it out together, we could have them send some of the regular patrolmen off the streets to talk to the kids at one of the Saturday morning lecture sessions. All right, Seal, he said. That makes sense. So they finished taking them on the tour. I was running around the tour with them, looking at different things all over the building. Along the way, I saw one of the regular sergeants, a cop that we knew. A black cat Huey and I had known for a time, and he complimented me. Bobby, he said, you did right, because these cats really will trump up a lot of shit on a lot of brothers. Huey and I dug him because he had told us that the only time he shoot a cat was if his own life was really in danger, if he saw somebody else's life in danger, or where the cat was actually committing a criminal act. But like in riots and stuff like that, he told us, cats breaking windows, I'm not going to shoot nobody over nobody's property, but I will arrest them. Me and Huey had definitely respected that fact about him, the fact that he said that if he was ordered out on a riot, he'd quit his job before he'd go out there shooting and killing. This particular cop always felt that he could do a lot from the inside, but he was isolated, isolated from that whole department. He gave us a lot of statistics and a lot of information about the entire Oakland Police Department and how 75% to 85% of them were racist. This black cop came up to me during the tour and told me that they wanted to talk to me upstairs. I said, okay, I can talk to them. So I went upstairs and Mr. Allen was up there. The woman foreman was up there and another member of the Department of Human Resources was up there. They didn't like me because I had stopped it. The police chief and assistant chief, Gain, he's the chief now, were sitting there, and they filled up their heads with certain attitudes they were trying to get off. Well, Bob, uh, I think that was uh, not a good thing. You know uh, that uh, the officers weren't able to talk to the kids. Well, I think that the officers should come to the community. Come down to the park where we meet on Saturdays. If you want to establish some community relations, come down and listen to the kids. They've got grievances too. They want to ask the police some questions instead of the police bringing us here and asking us questions. They are always trying to ask us questions, I said. Now we want the community and the youth to ask them questions. That's a better way to establish relations. Both of them can ask each other questions, 
but we want to stand on our own ground. So you send four or five regular officers off the beat, young ones and old ones, and we'll go from there. I'm pretty sure they'll go for that, the Saturday lecture class right before the baseball game. They came down the next day. The next morning, they were there, man. That same lieutenant came. They had some pamphlets stacked up with three policemen standing at attention in a very dramatic photo. They took the picture from a ground angle with the modern police headquarters building and the American flag in the background. And these policemen in the pictures were smiling. And on top, in big letters, they put, Police Community Relations. Then you flip the book over and you see all nicey, nicey things. You see pictures of a policeman helping a little white girl across the street. She's nice and neat and clean. There were no black people in the whole motherfucking pamphlet. I was checking that out, man. Oh, God damn, I said to myself. Isn't this a front and phony situation? The police chief is saying all kind of nicey, nicey things. And he doesn't say a word about the police brutality going on in the communities. And he doesn't say a word about racists and bigots. They had pamphlets and passed them all out. Then the lieutenant said, Well, uh, Bob, do you want to set the tone here? He was trying to be friends with me in front of the kids. Yeah, I set the tone. I said, Hey, you cats, all the questions we talked about yesterday after we left the police department, I just want the true facts. Things that you remember or that you heard people talk about that sound pretty true to you. Not exaggerated things. You can ask these policemen about those cases of police brutality and injustice that some of you have witnessed. You can go ahead and ask them about that. They say they want to start this community relations program and I know you can document a heck of a lot. I hate the day that I didn't tape that session. I hate the day. Man, those kids tore into the cops. They just tore into them. They talked about cops. They really talked about the police brutality that half of them had actually witnessed. Then they talked about stories they heard. I always made the point of asking, is this something you witnessed or is this something you just heard? Now be honest and say if you saw it or just heard about it. I was trying to get them to be objective as possible, although the many things they had heard were very significant too. Man, it made the cops mad, and they looked mad. What about the time? One little girl asked. Down on 14th Street, in front of the dance hall, down there on the other side of Cyprus, when a black woman was snatched by three cops and knocked down to the ground with the billy club. She was angry, too, when she said it. She made one cop just turn red. Now, do you think it's right for a big six-foot cop to throw a five-foot woman down on the ground and hit her in the head with a billy club? One of the officers kind of half nervously and trying to be serious and objective said, Well, maybe she had a weapon in her hand. Yeah, she had a weapon and they took it away from her, but after they took the weapon away from her, that's when they beat on her and that ain't right. I don't think no cop got no right to be beating on no woman. That sister was mad, and she put that over with every piece of emotion she had, and she sat down. Man, oh, that tore those cops up. Some of the guys were articulate, and some were very serious about what they had to say. Some were mad, and some weren't. Some just presented cases they heard and argued their cases as to what was right and what was wrong. There were a few points of law that the policemen were citing wrong. One cop actually stood up and said, No, you don't have a right to defend yourself. I said, Wait a minute. Are you telling me? Are you telling us? Are you telling all these young people here that if a policeman unjustly, criminally attacks and brutalizes them, they don't have a right to defend themselves? No, you don't have a right to defend yourself, the officer said. What you should do is take it and come down and file a complaint. Well, what about some of the ones who are dead? I asked him. Man, that upset the whole place. They can't come down and put in a complaint, I said. Well, uh, you know uh, that, that those cases are exaggerated. Exaggerated my ass, I said. 50% of them. 
50% of them, man, are outright cases of police brutality and police murder. Maybe the other 50% of them are related to some kind of criminal activity because we know that the brothers do commit crimes. We're not trying to hide that fact. But 50% of those cases are outright police brutality. Man, that upset the whole place. Then this little girl got up and she said, Say you. She was about 16 and she pointed at this one policeman. You don't have to treat him like that, I said. Bobby, I treat him like I want to because they done treated me so bad. Well, excuse me, sister, I said, and I sat back. This cop she had pointed to, he was red. He was shaking. She said, have you ever been to see a psychiatrist? That's what she said to this cop. This cop just looked at her and the lieutenant got ready to say something, but she started speaking again. I heard that policemen are supposed to go see a psychiatrist to see if they are psychologically capable of being a policeman. Have you ever been to a psychiatrist? He really got the shaking then, man. The way you're shaking now, she said, the way you're shaking now and carrying on, you must be guilty of a whole lot. And I ain't got no weapon or nothing. This is just an ordinary meeting between people and police in the community the youth here on this program and you're shaking. Not only do you need to see a psychiatrist, you need to be off the police force. Man, that cat was mad. That was a hell of a scene. I have never witnessed anything so beautiful. Those kids knew cases. They know, man. They know. That was so beautiful. And that was when I knew I became an enemy of the Oakland Police Department. This was about three or four months before the Black Panther Party got started. Most of the brothers really dug the poverty program and the way I ran it. I'm pretty sure that most of those kids learned a lot. I even found brothers who knew drafting. Since I dug drafting myself, I began to advocate to the advisory committee that the brothers should learn more skills in these programs and that we should set up more programs in the community so brothers who wished they had skills like brother Huey P. Newton could learn them. They should be taught by people who are really concerned with the brothers and not by these old time white racists who are trying to control them and misguide them away from unifying black people and serving black people. That was the scene. And there was something else, man.